friends. While Olivia was speaking in Spanish, the closed caption ended the message by saying, the key for power is Panama. The process of saying something, hearing it, writing it down, reading it, interpreting it, living with it, making your reading and your life coherent, it's a very messy thing. I'm a translator and an interpreter. But my main qualification for being here doing this Bible half hours is that I am not a biblical scholar. And I'm not a biblical scholar primarily for one very important reason that we really have to bring right out at the very onset. I don't know how to read Hebrew. I don't know how to read Greek. And that unknowing today is one of the primary bases of my qualifications. Think on that. I won't be talking very much about uh, the history of the text that we've been given as the Bible. Because if you want to learn more about, uh, you know, how it came in pieces and how it became uh, uh, coherent or how it was patched up and how some people took it as inerrant and how some people are um, uh, seriously dismissing it, all of that is a history lesson. And it need not have much to do with the way that the message speaks to our condition. I will mention a few things. Uh, I will talk about um, uh, here and there uh, about J and E and P and D, the supposed or the, uh, the identified different uh, redactors of different parts of the Bible and maybe how they come together. But most of all, most of all, I'm a translator. And most of all, I wanna say to begin with that what we have in the Bible, it's a complicated gift with a lot of wrapping around it. So if you think of an oral tradition with stories that at some point, get heard and they start being written down. You also have to think about many, many occasions in which it is rewritten. Sometimes the same stories, sometimes varieties of the same stories, sometimes interpretations of those stories as the condition of the writer requires. One of the things that happens when the Bible is translated into um, Greek first, into Latin, and then into the modern languages, is that the text, Hebrew text, the Greek text, basically finds its way again into the mouth, into the ear of those many, many, many people who all of a sudden were reading this text and didn't know Hebrew and didn't know Greek. So the history of translation into the modern language, the history of the makeup of the translated versions of our Bibles, 
because frankly, we only live with translated Bibles. It's a return to orality. And orality has changed because what people can hear in the space of a thousand years changes. And you can see the many versions of the Bible as a very honest, complicated attempt to make the text available to the ear. Translations sound more coherent to the contemporary ear, the receiving ear, than the original fragmented, patched up, transcribed, loosened pieces, canonized, ever sounded to a reader of whatever we might call, and I'm, not, I'm never gonna use the term original, but the first texts. The first texts are still copies. And we can't hear that. What we hear is translations. There's magic, there's joy in that dance, the Quaker meeting. We were all told that uh, we can individually hear what the voice of God is telling us within us. Our own heart, our own resonance chamber, our own receptor, our own decoding equipment, our own revelation. And we're told that it works individually. We're also told, glory be to God, that the Quaker, the Quakers here as a gathering, that the gathering has a manner of ears, that the gathering has a heart with ears, with eyes, with noses, with tongues to taste what the text may carry. And when we taste and we hear and we see, we're primarily not in relationship with a text, we're in relationship with a voice. And we're told as Quakers that that heart of the meeting also listens, also hears, and also gets the blessing of a revelation when it sees, when it seizes the power of the truth that's given. So if all we had was the value of the individual receptor, we would be moving into ranterism very quickly, as we have seen in the 17th century and beyond. But because we have this heart of the meeting, this heart of the group, we're talking about something else. Now, my readings of the passages that I'm going to bring to you have messed me up substantially and in fact being messed up it's one of the things that has made it most interesting this time around because i'm operating from a high end of uncertainty and i'm operating from a high end of certainty that i don't have the answer and that i'm not telling you what this text mean and then this text may not mean anything in particular as much as they provide things to graft onto our spiritual life. Stories to connect us to roots and stories to relate us to fruits.
And we have five more minutes. Let me show you a couple of things. Can you see that website? www.benignoxyc. How algebraic. X, Y, Z are all the variables that you're going to get this time. You're going to get a lot of variables. In there, you will see um, you will see a letter from me, which I want you to read before tomorrow. Um, you will see buttons for the different days. Each of those buttons have readings. And you will see uh, maintenance things in here. You will um, uh, you will see a button that leads you to a pastoral care uh, coordinator. Should you need pastoral care, would be very reasonable to 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 need pastoral care because some of these readings are upsetting. You also reminded that I do need questions and comments from you, but the Zoom room, I mean, the Zoom life is not going to let us do that um, right now as I go, but you can now start thinking about what questions you may have for me uh, or for my elders and what comments you may have for me and for my elders, and you can, you can send those in. You can send those in through the chat of this Zoom meeting. We're going to go into breakout rooms in a little bit. Um, by the time you're in the breakout rooms, you won't be able to uh, send any more uh, questions or comments. Let me, um, I'll talk more about the breakout groups, but let me show you. I had a lot of things prepared for Monday, but all we're going to talk about is this text of Margaret Fell coming out of Egypt. See what thou canst witness of him made manifest in thee, for there thou must find him, if ever thou know him for thy comfort. And see if that which is of him in thee be not in bondage. Egypt. See if that which is of him in thee be not in bondage in Egypt, in darkness under Pharaoh, which is the taskmaster, the fleshly man, which keeps the seed of God in bondage, the fleshly man, which keeps the seed of God in bondage. But my dear heart, Wait upon the Lord of the light of God in thee, which is Moses, and he will bring thee, he will bring the seed of God out of prison if thou hearken to it and be obedient to it. And the Lord will pour out the plagues upon Pharaoh and his host and bring forth his own seed that it may serve him in the land of the living. Nowhere in the Bible was it said that God could be imprisoned in our heart, dying to get out into the life and power. When Margaret Fell takes the Bible story She tells a totally different story of imprisonment and urgency of redemption and urgency of liberation. It's not the enslaved people or us as enslaved people. It's actually God himself inside the prison of our heart, 
God who are we are keeping prisoner in there, who wants a Moses to come and take him out of Egypt, the Egypt of our heart. I can't let you go. That's Pharaoh's line. Can't let you go yet into the freedom of the of the breakout room. Breakout room. When I was given the challenge to say something at the French General Conference gathering, the charge came with requirements. I was supposed to um, tell the people who would pick among proposals um, what my presentation would do, could do in the, to respond to the anti-racist condition of our people. Or the, uh, the need for an anti-racist growth in our people. And at that moment, when I got that letter, Pharaoh rose in me and God hardened my heart. And I said, what? I'm being asked to tell what I'm gonna say? Surely that's not rightly ordered. And then, I was told, shut up and listen. The friends at the gathering are telling you about their condition. And you're supposed to speak to their condition. And their condition is worth speaking to. They're saying we're in Egypt. We're trying to figure out how to get out of Egypt sit with a text and search. When um, I sat down with the, the topic of the of the gathering, way will open. Way will open. I said, uh-uh. It's not that way will open. That's a future hope. That's very nice. It's not that way will open. It's that way is already open. That's how the early friends said it. Way is already open, always open, always open inside you. And you don't walk into the open way. That's what's going on. Way is open and you don't walk into it. Way is open and you don't walk into it. That's what I was told. That is what I heard. And I was off. And I said, this is mine to struggle with. And so I thought about Moses. I thought about Moses and the people of Israel right there with the Pharaoh's armies on one hand and the sea at the other. And the sea, at the time I saw it, the sea was no longer closed. The sea was wide open. The Red Sea was wide open. And I just was not walking into it. I was not walking into it. And I thought of Moses. And I was given to write.
way will open as it has always opened. The Red Sea opened. The waters broke before me and then my mother's velvet opened and she pushed well and out at me. Midwives did not betray us. And so I was made by love for the crossing, tactically fed by my own mother's milk, groomed as their favorite toy into the gorgeous whims, hands, smiles, and privilege of Pharaoh's idle daughter. If I don't head into that mud and terror, into that open jaw of my one future, if I don't walk with one foot looking forward and the other flaunting an honest measure of dancing sinless joy, if I don't show the people how to move and keep moving away, from all the closing borders and the slamming doors and the darkening windows and the harvest of the plagues. If I don't break, if I don't break, if I don't break with everything that clings at me and keeps me tangled in the root of Egypt, if I don't break with everything clings at me and keeps me tangled in the roots of Egypt. If I don't, if I don't, then I will consent to drown all high and dry, stuck to a stillborn certainty. We're going to go into breakout rooms. In my letter to you, I talk about breakout rooms as little, dear little meetings, intimate little churches. If you want to go, if you want to stay in a breakout room in Spanish, Stay in the main room. Si usted quiere quedarse en un grupo pequeño en español, quédese en el salón principal de esta conferencia. The rest of you will be assigned by the spirit to your own little rooms, your own little churches. Enter them with the certainty that those friends have been given to you for the fellowship. Things will shut down by noon. You can look into the website to see the reading for tomorrow. I am a cruel taskmaster when it comes to reading. And there are blessings in that. Go. <laughs>